Hi everyone and happy Friday. Welcome to GeoHug. So I'm Jess from Prospectors in CoreSafe, your expectation gear and core handling experts. Uh, and I'm your virtual host today. I'm at Chris Cairns, what an absolute pleasure it is to have you on GeoHug today. Uh, so Chris is the Managing Director of Savely Minerals uh, and he'll be talking to us about their journey so far with the Kaylee Load Discovery. So thank you so much again for your time, Chris. I really appreciate that you've come on. Thanks, Jess. It's, it is a bit of an honor to be here. I've seen a couple of your earlier versions and I think it's a fantastic idea. I thought I'd just get on the, the back porch of the mobile home and, and deliver this talk. So, all right, look, I'm gonna share a presentation screen with you and uh, we'll get this thing rolling, shall we? So there's a large number of slides here. Um, I think there's 70 odd slides. Um, so I, I tend to roll through them fairly quickly. So um, I'll, I'll run through this fairly quickly. I do talk fairly quickly. There's a lot of information to get through. Um, I've actually cut quite a lot of stuff out, um, but uh, there, we did do two technical presentations, one at uh, Mines and Wines, um, just around the time of the discovery hall, and then one subsequently in November uh, last year at the Victorian uh, AIG Roundup. So if you're interested in the full technical presentation, that's, that's where you can find that information. And there's a lot on our website. If you go on to projects, the bottom tab is technical data, there's petrology reports, there's reports by Greg Corbett, there's animations, there's the, the um, seismic report. So if, if you're interested in diving deep, that's where you'll find that information. So normal disclaimer, um, we were a first mover into this area um, and uh, to cut to the quick in terms of the naming of the Cayley Loud, obviously named after Ross Cayley, the uh, Geological Survey of Victoria geologist who was a, a, a key member of a team uh, in the Geological Survey and also Geoscience Australia who uh, worked on the Staveley project and brought this really to prominence in terms of an ancient continental margin 500 million years ago and an Andean style convergent margin where it had potential for porphyries. And, and obviously Thursday's Gosson actually has been known for some time, but it was the leading candidate. Having said that, no previous mining history within the belt. Um, Victoria at the time was really languishing at the bottom of the Fraser Institute rankings in terms of uh, exploration destinations, probably primarily because of their uh, moratorium on conventional gas drilling onshore um, that they've recently rescinded. Um, but yes, when we when we took up these projects, uh, people had said to us, "Look, you need your head red. What what are you doing in Victoria?" Um, obviously, uh, times change. Uh, Kirkland Lake have obviously done very well at Fosterville. We've made a discovery, and now Victoria seems to be a bit of a red hot destination on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They go from frozen to scalding hot. It's scalding hot at the moment there with that Fosterville South IPO, now traveling uh, with a, a market cap in, in excess of $150 million. So it's, it's been quite the, quite the journey, um, but it was a bit of a brave call at the time. Um, we, we did make this discovery in 2019. I'll talk you through that. And really that's the, the essence of the, the presentation is, is how we got there. Um, it is a bit of a tortuous sort of path that we took. Um, we could have probably in hindsight uh, made it there a lot quicker. Uh, all the hints were there, um, but we were, um, I, I think as an excuse, we were fixated on the porphyry uh, type model. Um, and it wasn't until we drilled enough holes and got enough data that we really realized that it was um, a, a magma butte type system and that we should be focusing on the higher grade uh, structurally controlled mineralization. So we're well cashed up. We've just finished a raising uh, that we've got a uh, tranche one $16 million in the tin. We already had 9.4 tranche two subject to shareholder approval. And we've got a $3 million SPP out there. So <clears throat> we'll be, drilling here uh, well funded for the next 12 months at least. I hope it will get us through a substantial resource uh, statement and then um, a scoping study as well. 
Additionally, we'll test some port retargets, et cetera. So I'll just take you through all of that and I'll get away from the, the corporate style presentation. We'll go into a bit of a deeper dive into the technical stuff. So how did we get from here? Um, this was a rock that I saw on my site visit there in 2013 to here. Um, this particular uh, bit of drill core went two meters at 40% copper, three grams gold, and half a kilo silver. So how did we get from one to the other? Well, really the, the story starts, um, the management team were uh, ex Integra Mining. So we agreed to a takeover from Silver Lake Resources in 2012 at Diggers and Dealers. And um, as that was going through the, the paperwork phases, um, we were pretty much a lame duck board, if the truth be known, uh, up until January 2013 when, when it actually transacted. And we were looking for another opportunity. We wanted to keep the team together. Um, the early expiration in this project um, was uh, a stream sediment anomaly identified by WMC. Um, they didn't follow up. But Pennzoil did, uh, and they discovered um, the outcropping, or not outcropping, the float of uh, Gossen boulders in a paddock uh, at Thursday's Gossen. Uh, they analyzed one rock, champ, rock chip sample that went almost 3% copper. Um, they did a bunch of work to their credit. They really went hard in terms of a lot of IP, aeromagnetics, ground magnetics. They drilled 15 diamond drill holes. Um, they did intercept the, the secondary chalk site blanket um, in a fault zone and did interpret and made that linkage to uh, the interest of uh, porphyry. So that, that was good work on their part, but really uh, not enough to keep them in the project. Um, CRA came in, um, they were looking for a Hemlo style, disseminated gold platinum in the mid 80s. Um, they they um, did quite a bit of work uh, looking for that Hemlo more regional type stuff. And then North Limited came in and did uh, a bunch of work. They uh, drilled a number of uh, RC and diamond holes and their best result um, was uh, from Vic 1D2. So uh, the Victor Porphyry um, prospect number one, diamond drill hole number two, got uh, 229 meters at 0.22% copper and pretty spotty to negligible gold or anything else in it. Um, then 95, 97, uh, CRA and Rio Tinto came in as a joint venture. They did quite a bit of work as well and now they've drilled three by uh, 300 meter holes and their best result was in uh, a hole called, uh, um, uh, it was WL3, I believe it was. Uh, 27 meters at 0.24% copper. So nothing completely thrilling for them. But the image on the left there is a uh, master's uh, or the product of a master's study done by uh, Spencer uh, in 1996. And it's an analysis of a bunch of shallow air core drill holes, bottom of hole samples, and a PIMA analysis of the alteration mineralogy. And he created this map, um, which really mapped out to our mind um, the, what we call the Victor Porphyry, uh, at keeping with the North Limited sort of terminology. What we see in this project is in the central zone, uh, we don't believe it's advanced argillic because it's dominated by smectite to, to uh, kaolinite, so probably more appropriately called uh, intermediate argillic alteration in the core um, with quite a bit of uh, uh, stock work quartz fanning, um, and then that classic concentric zonation um, around the, the porphyry. Bloody bro brokers, eh? Anyways, sorry for that. Um, and that is what we consider to be the first phase, the early number one porphyry. It's a large and, and typical of these types of porphyries, large, low grade copper, plus or minus bit of molly type porphyry. And we do see a bit of a, a time gap then from that porphyry to porphyries two that we do see, and then three and four that we infer. So up the top in this image, you see a little discrete zone at the very top of the alteration zone with another intermediate argillic and sericitic zone. That's 
akin to where we see uh, another phase of porphyry, uh, porphyry number two, uh, we call the QDP porphyry, but the mineralization is actually uh, cross-cutting that porphyry phase, uh, D veins we believe from por porphyry number three, and then those D veins are reopened and uh, brecciated and mineralized with uh, high, uh, high tenor copper sulfides we believe is a prograde phase from porphyry number four. So this has been a very important, so uh, continue on, um, and uh, effectively, um, after that joint venture with Rio Tinto uh, JVing into the north ground and, and that being completed, north effectively dropped tenements. And their former Victorian exploration manager, Peter Legg, picks up the, app, uh, the prospect on application, uh, open ground uh, under a new vehicle that he's established called New Challenge Resources. He gets Newcrest to come in as a joint venture uh, from 2001 to 2004, and they didn't worry about too much regional stuff. They just focused on Thursday's Scots, and, and they did quite a lot of work. You know, uh, a lot of soil sampling, uh, air core drill holes, ten diamond drill holes, um, plus another one down to flavor. Um, but their best result was 32 meters at 0.73 percent copper, 0.41 gold from 22 meters in DSTD one. But that included a zone of eight meters at 0.24% copper and one gram gold. Um, we believe that to be a northwest extension of the Cayley load. Um, I've got, I think I've got a slide showing that, that drill hole. They did a couple of air core holes across as a traverse across that. And one of the holes finished in uh, the actual gossness material itself. But beyond that, they didn't follow up at all. So uh, BCD Resources picked up the project uh, joint ventured in uh, with um, uh, New Challenge Resources. Um, they initially were an earn in and then they decided to buy the project. They uh, gave New Challenge a 3% NSR. Um, they could buy back 2% of that. And, and just recently, we've completed a transaction uh, with New City where we've bought the entire 3% uh, royalty. So we're we're now without royalty and we own it 100% royalty other than the state government royalty, of course. Um, but uh, BCD came in with a, a slightly different approach. They were, uh, it was nickel exploration. They were employing an Avebury Tasmania uh, model where um, the Heemskirk granite comes up into uh, an ultramafic and remobilizes the nickel into a sulfide deposit above. Um, so they drilled quite a bit of uh, three, 32 RC holes, nine diamond drill holes, um, and their nomenclature in their drill holes was uh, SNDD or Stably Nickel Diamond Drill. Um, hole one uh, drilled from the uh, ultramafic through a contact structure uh, into the um, uh, host uh, volcano sedimentary sequence and got two intercepts, one at about 100 meters or 7.7 .7 meters at 4% copper, gram gold, and quite a bit of silver. Um, and at about 100, and then at 150, got another nine and a half meters at 3% copper and 0.45 gold. Um, a few other smaller intercepts. I do have a, a slide of that from our IPO, in fact, um, where we interpreted that. Um, but Beaconsfield had come out of administration as BCD resources after that mine disaster, and, and they wanted to go up to um, a project in North Queensland that was refractory and develop that and ship the concentrate down to. Uh, the process plant at Beaconsfield and process it down there. So they wanted some cash. And so um, they mandated uh, PCF Capital to sell the copper assets. Um, I reviewed the data and I wasn't that excited about the project. Um, you know, realistically, the best porphyry intercept was um, that 229 meters of 0.22 and the gold was neither here nor there, tell the truth. Um, and the project had about 30 diamond holes into it by that time, 150 to 400 meters depth. Um, so I thought it had been reasonably well tested. Um, and certainly in, in the case of uh, what, you know, the impression was that the, the large stage one porphyry, the Victor porphyry had been pretty well tested. Um, but I did accept a site visit in January, 2013. This is like only a week or more after we settled the integrity takeover. And so as I get to site, 
uh, all of the North Limited and CRA drill core was gone. Uh, presumably someone had taken it to the tip. Um, we, we, ever since we've not been able to track it down. Uh, some of the new crystals were available, but most of them were down at the, the core storage facility in Werribee. Um, and the upper portion of that critical hull, uh, the STD-1 that Newcrest had drilled, um, including that uh, a good interval of 32 meters at 0.8 and 0.4 uh, from only 22 meters depth was, wasn't available. And we, the core photos only start from 64 meters. So we, we suspect maybe it was mud rotary or, or some kind of percussion uh, as a pre-collar and then they went to diamond. Um, but crucially that BCD resources drill hole number one was available uh, and I was a little bit taken aback by what I saw when I, when I picked up that core. So at 95 meters, we're seeing this really strongly uh, hematite altered uh, bit of material, obviously very strongly oxidized fluid. There's chalcopyrite, uh, it's carrying gold. Um, at 156 meters, uh, a breccia with um, uh, an amazing amount of corrosion and, and the, the, the fragments here that are gone are fragments of serpentinite. Uh, the serpentinite has a large proportion of, of magnetite in it, up to 20% of the rock volume would be magnetite. And so these fluids have really reacted and, and completely scoured out the, the serpentinite and, and brecciated it. So a pretty impressive system. So very acidic, low pH. And likewise, further down the hall, um, uh, indications that all of the feldspars have been uh, dusted with hematite. So a very oxidized system. So really walking away from, from the site visit, uh, oxidized low pH system, great for metal carrying capacity. Um, the hydrothermal fluids are dissociated and produced uh, sulfuric and hydrochloric acid. High, so we're high up in the system. Um, the metal was there um, in terms of those two intercepts in that drill hole. And uh, so the conclusion was that it was a very large hydrothermal system in on the scale of like four kilometers uh, northwest, southeast, and uh, about a kilometer and a half to two kilometers across. Um, the fluid composition was very favorable for the type of system that we we're after. We, we very much were focused on a copper gold system, and there was good metal in the system. So it, it was looking very good in terms of its fertility and its scale. So th those were key, key criteria that we looked for. So this uh, image on the right hand side is our pre IPO conceptual model. It's in our prospectus. And so, you know, in the context of what we're looking at now with our, our current model, it looks pretty uncannily similar to what we're looking at now. I suppose the difference being that we thought that the porphyry was probably, you know, 400 meters to 500 meters down. And I think actually that was the, the narrative that I, I had mentioned at the time. Now we're thinking that that porphyry is more like a kilometer or slightly more down. But um, the, the model itself, aside from the, the dip of the structures being uh, steep to the east, we think, now think they're steep to the west. Um, it's, it's, it's uncanny. Um, anyways, uh, very, very neat sort of system. So we agreed to buy it. Uh, consideration was $2.8 million. Um, and uh, we, Sealed that in March 2013. We did some field work, some mapping, some IP surveys, a gravity survey for the remainder of 2013. Um, the team, I might add, was, was uh, Peter and I um, were unpaid. I think Jennifer took half salary. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we just put ourselves into this. And then we listed it in 2014, raised $6 million, and um, it was the only IPO in 2014 in the resources sector, and it was a pretty bleak time. But really, it was all retail. There were no institutions. It was mums and dads, friends and family, and obviously we had, uh, and we were thankful for the following that we got and the support we got from ex Integra Mining shareholders. So we, we got it away and got to work. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this the share price graph, uh, except to say you can see us pop up on the discovery. Uh, ironically, we had released pictures and a full description of this drill hole um, two weeks or three weeks prior to getting the results and the share market sold us down. Um, we've just done a raising, et cetera, et cetera. So we're well funded. And as I say, the whole team is ex-Integra Mining. 
So we ended up with this uh, big footprint on the belt. We, we controlled the main parts of the belt. Uh, subsequently, we were able to do a joint venture into the green areas, which is Navarre. Uh, we've earned in our, our majority stake there and continue to earn in on that project. And we've, uh, in the stably tender, we picked up that EL, a big red EL6870. Um, that's yet to be granted as we go through native title agreements and all that sort of thing. But our focus was uh, a large porphyry. That was the, the original concept. Um, this was in uh, the Grampian Stably zone. Um, and really the ancient continental margin, it's uh, uh, sort of ages wise, sort of 510 through to 495, 510 for the detrital zircons in the, in the Glen Thompson sandstone through to sort of 495 for Bushy Creek uh, complex, uh, those more plutonic intrusive type phases. Um, so it was a really quick development of this sequence in, in a, a, a short number of years. The sediments were laid down, it was turned upright, uh, it was intruded, and, and then just slightly later, uh, we believe the porphyries came in to the project. But it's really, you probably look, it's, it's contemporary with the Mount Reed volcanics, although I think that there are probably some chemical differences in the intrusions. Um, and it's, it's probably that 40 to 50 million years younger than the Lachlan Fall Belt. Uh, arc as well. So it's a collisional zone and uh, uh, Ross Cayley and the people at GSV and, and Geoscience Australia have done an incredible job in terms of the reconstruction of that uh, continental margin. So in the magnetics, you can see the arc. Uh, it's a relatively narrow arc uh, in the scheme of things, the, the bit that we're dealing with. Um, the GSV would have it, including those intrusions over on the left-hand side. There's zoned intrusions probably just a little bit earlier than the porphyries, but the way that they're zoned concentrically zoned gives us comfort that the intrusions are, are relatively upright. So we have a number of porphyries along the belt. Uh, Thursday's Gosson has been our focus. Uh, there's a couple of others that were known historically in terms of the junction porphyry. Uh, the Fairview Gold Prospect looks like a, a, a peripheral sort of quartz pyrite vein type system uh, on the margins of a porphyry type system. Wycliffe more of a VMS uh, flavor with uh, heavier sulfur isotopes. Patanga, a little bit of a wild card, not really well understood. Um, Mount Staveley was not considered a porphyry until we did some gravity work over that and it stuck out like proverbials. We subsequently, about 18 months ago, um, put two drill holes into that um, subpotassic alteration uh, quartz carbonate veins with uh, chalcopyrite rimmed by bornite, so definitely got the, the porphyry stamp. So in terms of the, the local geology, uh, this is what it looks like. It's it really where we're working is a little bit of a window. As you go further to the north, you get into transported cover coming off the um, Grampians, uh, an allochthonous block of uh, uh, Devonian sandstones. And then to the south, you get into the newer volcanics, which is a, a much younger um, uh, thin basalt cover, often only 20 meters thick, but definitely uh, very effective at obscuring uh, the underlying bedrock. Um, so what we've got on the left there is really the, the strat column from uh, Geoscience Australia and, and uh, Geosurvey Victoria and the Stavely complex sits in that. And it, I haven't included it, but it's worth looking at the uh, the um, seismic that they have shot over this belt and, and they, they show it as a, a buried arc primarily and there's not a lot of exposure of the arc. And this is just a little window and it just so happens that Thursday's Gosson and these other porphyries are poking out. So there's definitely a lot more potential um, along the arc undercover, but um, you know, it's, it's sort of challenging exploration. Um, you have to go about your work methodically and it'd be very useful if you had some sort of indicators of what you're looking for in terms of the geochemical fingerprint of the fertile intrusions, which we're not gonna share. So we focused primarily on Thursday's Gossen. Um, previous workers had to find a resource. Um, the outline of the porphyry there is in the beige hatch um, and the uh, chalcosite blanket is in the red outline projected to surface. It, 
occurs primarily between 30 to 80 meters uh, below surface. It's a relatively flat lying 50 meter thick blanket that's about 300 meters wide um, and, and quite long. It's a couple of kilometers long. It had, initially, it had always sort of intrigued me why the chalkite blanket was not developed on the entirety of the porphyry or, or at least a, a donut shape around uh, the margins of the porphyry. Um, and it wasn't until quite a bit later on that we kind of realized um, these, uh, the chalkite blanket's not developed on uh, low grade porphyry mineralization. It's actually developed on the weathering of uh, the surface expression of these high grade load style veins as they come to surface. So this is uh, the gravity image. Uh, we collected a lot of this data and you can see Thursday's Gaussian is expressed there as a gravity low uh, as the image is gravity is overlaid on grayscale magnetics. Um, the high uh, highly magnetic body you see to the northeast is the uh, Williamson's Road serpentinite, um, serpentinized uh, pritatite. Um, it's uh, a lot of magnetite in it, so obviously that explains the signature, but likewise potentially also enhances its uh, chemical reaction as a host lot. Um, the uh, fit in the middle of the image, you can see Mount Stavely also expressed as a uh, gravity low and also ultramafic thicken there. You've got a lot of this structural thickening going on through the belt and it's effectively uh, a left lateral step as you move north up the belt in, in a sinistral uh, uh, stress regime that creates a, a series of uh, little pull apart basins where the growth structures are in that northwest orientation and the strike slip structures are pretty much uh, north, west, north sort of uh, orientation. So down the bottom of that mag image, you can see uh, in the, uh, the quite uh, textured mag feature in the pink there, you can see uh, that's the um, uh, andesite breccia. Um, so you can see that left lateral movement uh, on that northwest. Um, and uh, you can see structural thickenings in the basal serpentinite as you go up the, the, uh, the sequence. The, the, that basal uh, serpentinite is, is not contemporaneous with the rest of the sequence. Uh, by analogy, it looks like it's somewhere in the order of about 650 million years. And so it's primitive base of, uh, basement uh, ocean floor stratigraphy that's been up thrust into that position. Um, and then you've got uh, the, um, the Fairview andesite breccia and the uh, Glenn Thompson sandstone unit, quite a thick turbidite sequence um, uh, either side of that. And so on the right hand side, again, that Spencer image of the air core Pima alteration mapping, quite an effective tool and, and does show that, that concentric zonation around that large phase one porphyry of the Victor porphyry. So we, our work, we identified a, a plus 25 uh, millivolt per volt chargeability anomaly uh, up to the north there. Um, we designed three diamond holes to drill into that. Um, and uh, it sat off uh, into an area where there was no previous drilling. So that was ideal for our purposes was to, to drill a target that had not been tested previously. And you can see on the right hand side of that figure, the uh, Beaconsfield hole with those two intercepts. And what happened re really is the you know, best laid plans of mice and men um, at around uh, 250 to 300 meters, uh, maybe just a little bit deeper uh, in the three holes drilled, uh, SMD one, three, and four. Um, we did drill uh, hole two further to the south in the junction porphyry. Um, all three of those hit these low angle structures. And so the, the shell there is the chargeability shell and uh, when we went through those low angle structures, um, we, we identified the structural offset very early. It was actually pretty easy. You went from uh, phyllic alteration associated with that chargeability shell. So it mapped it out quite nicely. And beneath the low angle structure, we then went into uh, propylytic alteration. So we got kicked further out into the, the margins of the system. So this was our interpretation. Uh, interestingly, in that low angle structure, it did have D veins with 
that were then brecciated, reopened, and had uh, boronite, chalcopyrite, and even molybdenite uh, in, the, in that structure. It's in a long-lived structure. Um, but really what we're showing here in the figure is that the hole started off in propolytic, got into a little bit of phyllic where the charge building anomaly was, then we went through that low angle structure and we were back out into the phyllic. And so the interpretation was that there was a little bit of a, an offset and that the target remained at depth on that ultramafic contact. So we were encouraged that we were seeing porphyry D veins. We felt that there should be a yellow brick road towards the, the source porphyry. And um, so we would just have to follow them down. Um, that obviously, again, not necessarily the case. Um, but we did recognize around this time that within the chalcosite blanket, there were two parallel zones um, of uh, better developed uh, copper gold mineralization. So not all of the air core drill holes were analyzed for gold and silver, which is a little bit of a mystery to me, um, saving a few bucks, I suppose. But that chalcosite blanket has never been uh, estimated in terms of a resource for gold and silver, just copper. Um, but within these parallel zones, the, the, the one to the northeast there now correlates very, very well with the Cayley load. Um, and then there's another one behind it that we believe represents what we call the copper load splay. Um, and so we, we determined that we would, um, we would test these structures. So we designed 20 drill holes in, in four fences uh, around a couple of the previous drill holes. So that N SNDD001 from Beaconsfield and also VSTD1 from uh, Newcrest. Um, we bracketed those. It was just really brute force exploration. It wasn't particularly clever, but we were just gonna drill a lot of holes around those previous good results. So we got some pretty interesting results. Um, there were some high grades, there was some spotty stuff, um, some wider intervals of, of moderate grade uh, intercepts. Um, so, it, you know, a bit, bit of additional encouragement and some, a bit of gold around too. And this is kind of what it looked like. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, the, the purple is the ultramafic, the serpentinite. We had now slightly changed our interpretation that it's stepping uh, uh, to the west on the low angle structure. And we see that now as, as part of a space accommodation for this pull apart basin type of, of concept where that's making the space for the porphyries to come up. But uh, hole 12 uh, got some interesting uh, results for us. We thought that that was uh, worth, worthy of following up. And we did have the concept, as you can see in the figure at, at the base there, that the, the fluids are leaking up subvertical structures. So we continued on. We put some diamond tails onto this and uh, we got some big intervals of low grade mineralization and you know, bits of gold around. So this is around the time where we started saying, well, shit, you know, these sorts of numbers look not dissimilar to the pre-discovery type intercepts at, at Cadia Ridgeway. Um, and I, I suppose that, that mental space where we we're at there um, kind of led us, unfortunately, down a rabbit hole a little bit um, to the extent that, um, yeah, we got some nice results on, of structurally controlled uh, material in these late D veins, um, but we did, uh, with the analogy of, of, of Cadia Ridgeway, holes 15 initially, then 16, 17, all intercepted significant intervals of these porphyry M veins. And so, you know, we, we had those pre-discovery like intercepts, uh, and now we're into the M veins that look also like um, uh, Cadia Ridgeway. So this is what they look like, that's uh, hole 15. Um, very dense, uh, sheeted um, to random uh, magnetite veins. The, the very early phases in terms of the, the wispy ones, plus the ones that I call railroad track uh, M veins with, with magnetite on the outer margins and then quartz on the inside. Um, and very high density for 120 meters of this stuff um, without uh, you know, any relaxation of the intensity. It was just pretty incredible. Multi-phase, um, we really thought that we were onto something here. So 
Uh, the, and the whole 17 started getting into these laminated end veins. They had intergrown chalcopyrite. You can see a little glint of something in that cross cutting vein there. Um, there we, we took them to be akin to the Ridgeway E2 veins. And, and this, okay, that this led us down a bit of a rabbit hole and we did expend a lot of effort and, and time and money trying to chase this target. So we're up the top there and we've drilled from hole 15 through to pretty much hole 49, um, trying to chase these M veins and trying to find a, a, a Ridgeway uh, equivalent. Um, we identified a north side structure and there was some mineralization on that structure, but it was a clear structural break, a sinistral uh, movement, uh, probably of about 200 meters. Um, and we started hitting M veins on the other side there as well. So we've gone from hole 15 up to sort of 35, 36, and we're still hitting M veins uh, 20 holes later. And we, we continue on. There's no ex exposure of this material, so you have to drill. You have no other choice. Um, we did see, we were getting other in areas of encouragement. We're seeing uh, epidiodactinolite, magnetite, intergrown with chalcopyrite. Um, and so, we continued to follow it. Um, we were using a bunch of other methods as well, so a lot of um, halo work, so uh, white mica wavelengths, um, a lot of geochemistry, vanadium over scandium ratios, um, uh, uh, anything, any tool that we could use to give us a vector. And so with respect to a composite uh, section, this is what it started to look like. We had this uh, QDP or, or porphyry number two, there was a, a, a strong host of these uh, M veins. Um, in the andesite, we started to see quite a lot of the um, sort of A-type veins um, uh, and also aplite vein dikes um, uh, and also another phase of intrusion, the high phosphorus microdiorite, which chemist chemically remains a bit of a mystery to us. It, it's clearly contemporary. It has those M veins in it. Um, but it contains over 3,000 ppm phosphorus and, and um, you know, uh, uh, high levels of titanium. And it is geochemically unique relative to the other intrusives in the sequence. And it does not seem to be genetically related um, compositionally, but temporally it is. So this is really an unresolved problem for us. So in terms of the key elements, we've got the host units. Um, the, then we have the, the intrusions, the QDP, microdiorite, high phos microdiorite, and dacite porphyry uh, is a Victor I porphyry. Um, and then we've got the main structures that uh, ultramafic contact structure, the low angle structure, north south structure, and uh, another structure we've identified being the copper load splay that's not listed here, by the way. Um, then we've got sort of the, the, the syn mineralization type events with the aplite vein dikes and AM veins, the porphyry M veins in the QDP and that high phos microdiorite um, looked really, really good, really intense, a very fluid system, the right chemistry in terms of, of, of oxidation, just not enough metal. Um, but what we do see is that that porphyry too, the QDP is cut by these massive to semi-massive porphyry D veins. So that might be late stage um, uh, QDP, but we think that it's actually late stage porphyry number three, um, cutting the QDP. And then later, um, those D veins are then uh, refractured, opened up and brecciated and infilled by the high tenor copper sulfides that you see. And there's the classic photo um, from hole 44 um, I'll show later in the, in the presentation that just completely fire dikes and, and they do take advantage of some of the mineralized structures and are a pain in the ass because they've stoked out or, or displaced some of the mineralization. But that's geology for you. Um, we have done quite a lot of sulfur isotopes, uh, particularly in, in around those M veins and we have some very light uh, numbers and, and it, it does correlate very, very well with those porphyry M veins. But again, 
uh, not a metal productive phase. We've just taken in excess of another 100 samples uh, there at University of Tasmania for uh, trying to characterize both the, the pyrite and the chalcopyrite phases on the Cayley load. And we're certainly hoping in the plane of that Cayley load that we're going to see a zonation in terms of the, the sulfur isotopes. So we did those up to hole 49. Um, 49 is, is in the red circle there. It was drilled to the south. It was looking, um, uh, sorry, I might be ahead of myself. We drill, also in the process, we drilled holes 44 and 45 on the right hand side of that red circle, drilling the other way. Um, and we've hit uh, two structures on the way down with those holes. I think both of them 1200 meter holes. Um, so this is hole 44. Um, almost a kilometer of 0.23% copper. So it's a, it's a very big system. Um, the uh, indicated location of the copper load splay is now modified. We don't believe it's in that orientation. We think that it's, it's a northwest oriented structure, the subvertical. But uh, we did intercept in this hole um, 10 meters at 2.5% copper, 0.3 grams gold. And then the hole continued through to the north south structure at depth um, at sort of 920 type meters, um, got 40 meters at 1.6% copper, 0.3 gold. Um, we actually pulled back in that hole and uh, set a wedge at 500 meters and, and went again trying to get a shallower intercept. And we got 18 meters at 3.62% uh, copper, 0.28 gold and half an ounce silver as well. So. Pretty interesting numbers, but those are quite deep. And this is what it looked like, you know, at 925 meters. We've got this early quartz pyrite phase that, uh, to intents and purposes, is barren. And then that's cut uh, by this uh, bornite, in this instance, sort of browny orange sort of color, because I think I'd cut it maybe 20 seconds before the photo. And then uh, uh, intermixed with that bornite is uh, this silvery uh, gray. Uh, mineral chalcosite, and so that's where you get your grade, of course, out of these high tenor copper sulfides. And that wedge, uh, as mentioned, it also got another 400 meters of 0.3% copper, but a high grade intercept in the north south structure of 18 meters at 3.62 and some higher grade intervals as well. Again, you know, that's thanks to those um, higher tenor copper sulfides, and certainly a bit of gold around as well. And so this is a, a classic example of that uh, massive to semi-massive pyrite uh, being brecciated and infilled by the higher tenor copper sulfides up above uh, covalite and bornite, instantly recognizable, and below bornite with the silvery chalcosite um, in amongst that. And so we do have a parogenesis where we go, um, we actually go from chalcopyrite through bornite, covalite, chalcosite, um, digenite, uh, energite, and uh, I think it is in this hull or, or, or the original hull 44, where also uh, energite. So we, we're seeing uh, trace amounts of these more arsenical copper sulfides at depth, and that's entirely consistent with the sort of zonation of these butte magma type systems. So most of the stuff that we're drilling in the Cayley load near surface is in the chalcopyrite zone, uh, as we go further at depth, we start getting into the, the bornite cobalite zone, which should then trans, uh, transition into the energite zone as we go a little bit deeper and get closer to the porphyry. So we had intercepted the copper load splay a couple of times. Um, uh, this figure is quite old, so the copper load splay is now considered to be parallel to uh, the, the black dot dashed line, um, but the intercepts in that uh, are considered significant, um, particularly hole 32, at around uh, 550 to 600 meters depth, six meters at 6.7% copper, almost a gram gold, and uh, one meter at 22.8%. And this is what it looks like. Again, it's transitioning into this, uh, you can see the, the, the massive pyrite and the little hairline fractures are filled with chalcosite. And, and the striations on that drill core are the chalcosite because it's so soft. And then the darker areas north of that or just above that 
are, are boronite. So it is entirely consistent with that zonation of those, those uh, copper load style. Uh, so speaking of magma, uh, the magma veins were mined for 86 years uh, before BHP in 1996, I think spent $3.1 billion buying the magma copper company. It was an integrated business um, with a smelter and a mine. Uh, after BHP acquired it, they realized in fact that the mine was losing money, but the smelter was highly efficient. So they just started, they closed the mine, started smelting other people's ore and uh, eventually sold that business unit off, but retained the mine. They let Rio Tinto in on a joint venture and, and they, I think there were early holes that indicated there might be something down there, but Rio Tinto largely uh, accredited with drilling the holes that discovered the resolution for free. Um, it's at a, a kilometer and a half top of mineralization, um, 2 billion tons, 1.5% copper, um, and genetically uh, related to the magma veins. And so we expect that we can follow our veins down to a porphyry targeted depth. Worth saying, the Butte, uh, Montana, does have porphyries at depth, but they're low grade. And, and Scott Halley has a theory that it's a third phase of porphyry that comes through that system and remobilizes the incipient early phase uh, copper porphyries into the vein system above. So um, yeah, there are variants on the theme. So interestingly, as I say, there is that zonation of, of uh, sulfide species and, and so even within the porphyry, you go from a pyrite, chalcopyrite pyrite at the base of the wall rock porphyry mineralization up into a higher sulfidation assemblage, uh, digenite, covalite, enagite. And likewise, that then continues on the left-hand side into the vein system where uh, at the base of the vein system, you're in that more arsenical copper sulfide. And we have seen uh, a sulfide called co uh, colusite, which is a, a copper vanadium uh, arsenic iron sulfide uh, type locality butte um, at depth. And then you go up through the various stages of tenantite, boronite, chalcopyrite, and then out to the margins to the more base metal, precious metal style mineralization. And in fact, at Butte and, and uh, Magma, the very earliest mining was native silver at surface in those distal positions. So in the Magma case, this is what it looks like in the plane of, of the vein. Um, so energite down this, at depth, uh, imagine the porphyry off to the, the bottom left corner and you go through the various zonations. Most of our drilling near surface is in that chalcopyrite zone. Um, we do see, uh, we believe, fingers of the boronite zone coming up into that near surface environment. And in fact, that's what we believe our, our discovery hall was. You know, the 6% copper gram gold was dominated by boronite as per the pictures. Um, but we have drilled hole 73 up to the northwest that has given us a uh, sphalerite dominated intercept that was uh, five meters at 2.35% sphalerite, 1.67 grams gold, 0.4 lead, 0.2 copper, and uh, you know, a few you know, 30 grams silver, that sort of thing. But most of our drilling at the moment in the Cayley load is in the chalcopyrite zone, and we do believe that we've got the boronite zone uh, yet to get into uh, below us. And just a neat little combo sort of uh, diagram by section and plan of the uh, Butte Montana thing, just showing those fluids circulating through that system and into that sort of seven kilometer lateral vein system, hundreds of veins, you know, just an incredible system. So this is what it looks like in section uh, geology wise on the left and alteration wise on the right. We do a lot of, well, every meter we do with the um, short wavelength infrared. And so we do see these narrow zones of pyrophyllite around uh, the main structures, but Greg Corbett would caution that you can't think of these types of systems in the context of high sulfidation or low sulfidation. Don't, don't get trapped into those pigeonholes in terms of the epithermal type nomenclature, because inherently in those types of, of descriptions, you're describing uh, systems that have quite a significant amount of wall rock in fluid interaction. Whereas this type of system is, there's very little of that. The, the, the alteration halos are quite narrow and, and really the, the systems here are expressed in the context of uh, a mineralizing fluid evolving 
as it, as it, uh, it moves uh, upwards and laterally in the sequence. And so it, it, it cools, it dissociates, it becomes more acidic, um, and then laterally it becomes more base metal rich. And, and even further out, we do see uh, various examples of carbonate base metal, precious metal style mineralization where we can get you know, locally quite good gold grades, but you know, very difficult to hang together. So it, it, is, it does have high sulfidation slash low sulfidation mineralogy, but, but it doesn't have the same amount of uh, fluid wall rock reaction. So we'd done a lot of this work and, and some deep drilling with these holes and we'd mapped out the vanadium scandium, uh, scandium uh, ratio uh, greater than 15 and we got the uh, a southerly plunge and we mapped out all of the sulfide species zonation uh, at depth. And so we uh, decided that we were gonna drill a, a 1800 meter hole or I think it was drilled to, it was designed to 1500 meters but drilled to 18. Um, straight down the throat of this thing, looking for the porphyry core. Um, well, we found that um, it went straight down the guts of, uh, of the QDP porphyry um, and into the barren core, uh, a, a lot of albite, um, quite a bit of epidote, etc., but very low sulfide. Um, so Scott Halley uh, very uh, constructively suggested, well, why don't you put the porphyry search off to the side for a little moment. You can't afford to be drilling 1800 meter holes for too long as a junior. Maybe you should look for some of this higher grade mineralization close to the surface, especially given that there were already some pretty reasonable indications. So um, the uh, site geologist was tasked, uh, Hamish Borgen, with designing a hole. He designed up hole 50 in the white circle there, targeting uh, the ultramafic contact fault in the black dash. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. So 32 meters, 6% copper gram gold from 62 meters drill depth, including those higher grade intervals. And as mentioned, two meters of 40% copper. If you had 100% chalcopyrite, pyrite, you'd only get 26% copper. So you really need bornite or chalcosite or best both in combination to give you that really high grade. So nice. Uh, on the photo on the right, nice bornite tiger stripes in massive pyrite. Uh, so this is the second phase of mineralization coming through. And on the left-hand side, the bornite with the gray silvery uh, chalcosite in its first amongst it. Um, the hull, surprisingly for us, also uh, got this 4.4 uh, meter interval of 4% nickel and a bit of cobalt and plus 1% chrome. Um, the chrome is both in residual chromites, but also uh, chrome uh, secondary minerals. Um, we, don't, we see this occasionally. Uh, we don't see a lot of continuity to it, so we don't believe that it's got much in the way of economic interest. But it, really for us, it speaks to the nature of the fluid. This is incredibly low pH, incredibly oxidized fluid. We see textures um, where the serpentinite has been completely dissolved and, and the contained silicate nickel and cobalt and other minerals have been transported higher up the, in the structures and then precipitated as sulfides. In, in this particular case, the petrology comes back as millerite and biolerite. So we've now got mineralization identified over one and a half kilometers. It shows that classic um, zonation up the northwest there, that hole 73, that uh, five meters at 2.35% zinc, 1.67 grams gold. And then down the bottom right hand corner, hole 85, it was drilled un, uh, under a southern fence line of a block of ground that we haven't yet at, had access to. We hope to later in the year. Um, but that at 350 odd meters depth, got 23 meters at a percent copper bit of gold with a higher grade zone in it as well. So we, we think that the, you know, the zinc gold mineralization probably is in our, our economic focus at the moment. Uh, it's the the copper rich mineralization, we've defined sort of the resource area so far over about six to 700 meters. It's open to the north, it's open in that paddock south of the railway. Uh, we think that there's a 300 meter extension available to us there. So we're, the mind's eye, we've started to think about a kilometer of strike extent for the resource. This is what it looks like in long section, uh, as mentioned on that right hand side is hole 85 drilled off that southern fence line. Then that gap where we haven't had access 
uh, hoping to have later in the year. And then into the main body of where we've been drilling, that Beaconsfield hole, SNDD001, uh, you know, 7.7 meters of 4% copper to gram gold is pretty much where that question mark is on the left hand side of the pink shape. Um, so there's extensions available to the north. We're starting to pull it down below that low angle structure and certainly we would anticipate given that we do have hits on the north side structure at in excess of 900 meters depth that this mineralization will continue uh, to in excess of a kilometer. And then we continue uh, off to the left, that little blue dot is that hole 73, um, the five meters at 2.35% uh, zinc and 1.67 grams per ton gold. So we're very well to the, the magma model and it's giving us a vector to the southeast and a depth for the uh, fluid source. So just a couple of uh, sections of uh, holes recently drilled, hole 87, uh, 87 meters of uh, almost 2% copper, half gram gold. And an open pit will take that uh, in its entirety. Um, interestingly, where we do get uh, these types of intercepts and, and as a general comment, um, they do have higher grade zones within them that are quite coherent. Um, so in this instance, 24 meters at 4.2% copper and a gram and a bit gold, and nine meters at 4.1% copper and almost two grams gold. Um, this is another example of where we're starting to see the bornite start to come in, and, and we would expect uh, better grades of copper at, uh, above that typical chocolate pyrite style, um, and also the uh, affinity of gold to the bornite increases the gold grades, I believe. So. Those sub-intervals will be interesting in, in the context of uh, the potential for underground mining. And, and that theme sort of carries on in the next sections, all 88, nice 30 meter, 2% copper, 0.23 grams gold, bit of silver, um, great for an open pit. But again, those sub-intervals are in excess of 3% uh, copper and a bit of gold, bit of silver. Um, and then on the right hand side, hole 89, same theme, um, you know, 10 and 20 meter intercepts that'll go really well on in the open pit, but at depth underneath that low angle structure, that 9.7 meters at 3% with almost a gram gold. So we're starting to see that, that, that stronger gold flavor, which is very heartening. Again, I've spoken extensively about this magma system. Uh, it, it really is conforming very, very well. Um, we, it's a low arsenic system, even though I speak about uh, trace enagite and colucite uh, at depth. Uh, at the levels that we're at, we rarely see arsenic numbers in excess of 100 ppm, uh, negligible antimony, no uh, mercury. Um, so it should, uh, by petrology, uh, look, it looks like it's gonna produce a very clean concentrate. There's a nice animation on our website on the sidebar, uh, give you an idea of the geometries and the 3D relationships between what we're talking about. Uh, in 94, uh, the uh, North, North Limited did fly an EMIM survey, and so you can clearly see those three main structures where we've hit mineralization, the ultramafic contact fault, the copper load splay, and then the north-south structure. So these are little left lateral steps in a, in a north-south oriented sinistral movement. So the uh, north-south structures are going to be dilatant over relatively short strike extents where you just have a little, uh, little jog, uh, probably steeply plunging, uh, uh, ore shoots, whereas that northwest orientation is the growth fault in the pull apart basin and they're mineralized over their entire strike extent. Um, in the case of the ultramafic contact fault so far, one and a half kilometers. In the copper load splay, we've hit it at depth, we see it in the shallow air core. So this is the way we see it in section. Um, the discovery hall up on that ultramafic contact fault uh, at shallow depths. Um, we've hit no, numerous intercepts underneath that low angle structure. Again, we have confidence that mineralization will continue to a kilometer or more depth because we do have deep hits uh, on other structures. That copper load splay, we've got a good hit in hole 32, um, six meters at 6.7% copper with that meter at 22. Uh, and then hole 44, 10 meters at 2.5% copper, 0.3 gold. And that drill hole uh, continued on to the north-south structure. Initial hit was 40 meters at 1.6. Uh, 
Um, and then this, we came back 500 meters, put a wedge in and came back at it for another 20 meters at three and a half percent copper, 0.3 grams gold. So we've got it over a kilometer vertically, we believe. Um, our, our objective is to complete that shallow resource drill out. So this is the material people can think of as available for open pit. Um, while we're going into a, a scoping study on that phase one type development, the drills will be deployed to take that mineralization down to depths. As I say, we, we're confident we can get down to a kilometer on that. Likewise, we'll bring that copper load splay mineralization closer to surface and take it to depth. Um, hopefully it contributes to the open pit because we do see it in air core. But really where I want to get the market's mind is that um, the phase one development of a shallow open pit um, will uh, will drive the project, the capital investment, and then off the base of that open pit, a decline will come in and spiral between the ultramafic contact fault and the copper load splay. Um, and given that uh, the vertical rate of advance uh, of an underground is about 50 or 60 meters a year, if we can demonstrate a kilometer of vertical extent, we're talking a couple of decades of mine life for the underground. And of course, we'll bring that uh, uh, north-south structure mineralization closer to surface. Um, it may be of, again, limited strike extent, but it will be attractive to pop across there and grab some high-grade underground uh, if you're in the area. So we have regional targets to test, like Mount Stavely, as I mentioned earlier, and of course the porphyry, what's driving this system. So to that end, we uh, shot two lines of seismic earlier this year. Um, over the porphyry, they, they're oblique to each other. That way we can correlate between the two in terms of uh, uh, off-section uh, reflectances. Um, there's, uh, this is from the high size report. The interpretation is that there's a magma chamber at depth with two porphyries coming off in a rather phallic sort of fashion uh, with surrounding potassic alteration zones in red, um, a phyllic alteration zone above in, in green, and the interface between the phyllic and the uh, potassic uh, is giving us reflectors. That's the yellow zone. That's the target zone. Um, we did extensive uh, drill core measurements of, of acoustic velocity and, uh, and it determined that the, the, the most significant determining factor for uh, uh, seismic uh, reflectance was the alteration type, not the lithology type. And so we had this massive contrast between the more competent, more hematite rich uh, potassic alteration and the quartzerosite uh, phyllic alteration. So there is an animation on our website, again, under that technical data tab. I do recommend you to that. So the plan um, really is just to drill out the shallow resources. We'll commence a, a scoping study on that. Then we'll, the drills will move into drilling the Cayley load uh, down to depth. I don't feel compelled to drill that out at a, a high density resource uh, uh, density. Really, it's a case of, of giving uh, us comfort that it, it does continue. Um, the copper load splay and, and, uh, and those structures need to come in with respect to uh, their contribution potentially for an open pit, but certainly importantly as, as con a contributor to the underground, uh, it really makes something robust if you can access two ore bodies from the one uh, underground development. Um, and that really, uh, our objective is to demonstrate that the open pit underpins the development and then the underground is a multi-decade mine life. But the caveat is that we've got a lot of drilling to do. Um, we've got those modifying factor type studies to do, which we've commenced in terms of metallurgy and geotech, um, bought a whole bunch of expensive equipment in terms of environmental monitoring. We've drilled the holes for groundwater monitoring. Um, but yeah, it, you get on the, on the, the treadmill with this thing and you just got to, you know, do the paces and, and, and you get there in the end. Um, we do have uh, an intention to drill test those porphyry targets commencing in November. Um, so we'll drill uh, 500 meter pre collars in PQ, we'll case off, uh, we'll have a rest over Christmas and then we'll come back, run HQ triple tube inside the, the casing and push those holes then down to one and a half kilometers to test those porphyry targets. And a few regional targets like Mount Stavely need testing as well. So the discovery team, I'm in the middle, Hamish Forgan, our Victorian geology managers on the right, you know, Grizzly Adams looking character, and uh, Greg Corbett uh, has been with us along the way. He's been out to the site six times. He probably comes out every 
six or eight months and he's seen every stick core that we've ever drilled. So it, it really has been important. And if, I've, if I have any advice for any um, aspiring uh, young exploration geologist, it would be, um, look, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. You just need to know who is and make sure that you speak to them and, and get their opinion. Because um, without Greg Corbett and Scott Halley's uh, contributions to our, and Paul Ashley for that matter, in terms of petrology, Without their contributions, we really would have been uh, sort of staggering around in the dark and, and it, the recognition that we're in a magma type system uh, has fundamentally changed our approach and, and has led us into a discovery. So it's, it's that important. So that's pretty much it. Um, you know, we've got this system. Uh, it is the magma type thing. We kind of forgive ourselves a little bit because this type of system hasn't been seen in Australia before, but you know, it took us 50 drill holes to get there. Um, but we do have this thing over from surface down to about a kilometer's depth. And you know, our drilling to date has only been on a fraction of one of three structures that we know of that are mineralized. The, the seismic has identified other subvertical structures um, they'll be tested as we come across the sequence with those deep porphyry drill holes. So it's two birds with one stone in terms of that drilling. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very, very keen to see uh, where those deeper holes end up because uh, you know, we've got a very, very interesting project at the moment, but if we get onto uh, a, a resolution type porphyry, then it's a different game entirely. So um, that's where we're at. And uh, thank you very much for your time.